one book. It's a movement that began in 1998 under the leadership of Nancy Paul. She's the executive director of the Washington Center for the Book in the Seattle Public Library. Now, the goal of one book is to bring people together over a single book, to use the power of great writing to build a community. One book is in its third year here at BCC, with the first year devoted to Marjane Satrapi, I knew I'd mess that up, innovative graphic novel, Persophilus, and the second to Mitch Albom's touching and instructive memoir, Tuesdays with Maury. During the first two years, and this is important, the enthusiastic examination of a common text helped to connect nearly 1,000 students across campuses in three cities, a remarkable accomplishment for a purely voluntary activity. The success stems in large part to the efforts of the members of the One Book Committee. They are the ones who have done the heavy lifting, publicizing the program, soliciting nominations of prospective books, and coordinating voting and using their own considerable personal capital, their reputations as lovers of the printed word, to encourage participation across the college. They richly deserve our thanks, so thanks. Now, as you know, this year's one book selection is The Things They Carried, Tim O'Brien's stark, searing journey through the Vietnam War. And I am truly honored to introduce today's guest speaker, Mr. Bob Kerr, a journalist and Vietnam veteran who will discuss the power and impact of O'Brien's work, which, as he noted, became the Vietnam novel for veterans. For the past 17 years, Mr. Kerr has been the featured local columnist with the Providence Journal, a position he calls the best job on the paper. And his popular column appears in the paper three times a week. A native of New York who lived in Michigan as well, and he's a lifetime Detroit Tigers fan, which makes him very happy and much different from those of us who were Red Sox fans and don't know. He attended Gross Point University School. He graduated from Hamilton College in Clinton, New York, and then enlisted in the U.S. Marines and shipped out to Vietnam. From September of 1968 to September of 1969, Mr. Kerr served as combat correspondent in Vietnam. When he returned to the States, he interned at his childhood newspaper, the Detroit Free Press, moved on to the Charlotte Observer, and in 1971 joined the staff of the Providence Journal. Now, even occasional readers of Mr. Kerr's columns knows that he champions the ordinary person and the underdog, that he expects politicians and leaders of business and industry to do the right thing, that he longs for a society that recognizes and addresses inequities, and especially relevant to, to this year's one book selection, that he regularly reminds us all that our combat veterans, those who fought in Vietnam, the Gulf War, Iraq, and Afghanistan, don't always get what they deserve in terms of support from a government that asks so much of them. Now, this is a passage from a piece that I, written by Bob that I've used in one of my books. Uh, the best story turned out to be no story at all. But this is what Bob Kerr has to say in part about Vietnam. Sometimes there is a feeling that we should make it all mean something. Find out the role Vietnam plays in making us the people we've become. But most of the time, I think, there is a simple gratitude that we were able to survive the great adventure of our generation, hold on to the memories, and enjoy the slightly crazy edge we've all been granted by historians, movie makers, and stand-up comics. The memories are dark and cruel, funny and drunken. I was given a wonderful window on Vietnam when the Marine Corps made me a combat correspondent and allowed me to move around with a freedom some generals didn't enjoy. I was able to stop and watch and listen sometimes. So make no mistake about it, Bob Kerr's writing is powerful and insightful. On most days, it is the best thing that appears in a very good newspaper. And he's the only person I know, and likely the only person you will ever meet, who has owned his very own fire engine, or at least a share of one. With great pleasure, I present Bob Kerr. Thank you. Good morning. It's nice to be at my neighborhood college. I live just a few blocks away. It's also nice to be at a college where the president, I think, was recently named Veteran of the Year. Is that correct? So. I'm going to um, I'm going to pretty much ramble all over the place today. Um, talk some about the book, some about Vietnam, how the two come together, um, 
and I know the idea is I will talk and maybe you would want to ask questions. But if there's any point where you just want to jump in and ask a question or make a comment, challenge me on something, um, feel free. Because it, sometimes a little conversation is the best way to go in something like this. Um, I can give you a little background to start with how I ended up where I ended up. It was very unlikely, actually. But um, I was just telling Bill, I, uh, I was at Hamilton College, which is a liberal arts school in upstate New York, in my senior year. And I did not know where my life was going, but it sure wasn't going to grad school with my grades. And Vietnam was hanging out there. And the draft was hanging out there, as a dean reminded me one year when I was close to flunking out. And I walked into the student center one day, and there were two guys in dress blues. And this is how much thought went into this. I said, that's a great looking uniform. <laughs> and I signed up. And I had a pulse, so they took me. And I think I was in Syracuse the next day for my physical. And in the fall of 1967, um, I headed for Chronicle, Virginia, for officer candidate school. Um, I just want to say, as crazy as it was, and as ridiculous as it was, um, the Marine Corps and Vietnam were my attempt to kind of break out of a very predictable white middle class life uh, and kind of jump off the cliff. And I will always be incredibly grateful for what the Marine Corps did. Um, I don't know why I'm getting like this. Um, anyway, um, it's not that the Marine Corps turned me into the badass bar brawler I thought it would. <laughs> it didn't work that way. But it did, open, it did open me up to just incredible experiences and people um, I don't think I would ever meet any other way. And why this is so good, why this, I'm so glad that you're reading this, is that it was the first real novel to go where others hadn't gone. This is a very incredibly courageous book. And Tim O'Brien kind of pushed the limits. And I remember going to Brown probably 10 years ago to, see, to hear him read from the things they carried. It was, a, it was a weekend of Vietnam writers at Brown. It was a wonderful weekend. Um, Philip Caputo, who wrote a wonderful book called Rumor of War, was there and some others. And he read the part about going to the camp in northern Minnesota to decide if he was going to respond to his draft notice or go to Canada. And he read it in a way that had this full auditorium at Brown just deathly quiet. And it was, I mean, it was incredible. And he was, I don't know if he's trying to be dramatic or not, but, um, and then he finished it, and you hear it, and you think, well, that's a piece of his life. And he looks up, and he said, of course, that never happened. And then he said, which just goes to show you don't have to tell the truth to tell the story. And that's the strength of this book, because he talks about that style of writing a little bit in the book itself, how he adds things and enhances things to make the story work. Um, but um, let's see. I, I apologize. Um, when I when I went into the Marines, um, strangely enough, I got to Quantico to OCS, and they didn't consider me officer material for some reason. They decided pretty quickly, I think, that I wasn't officer material actually, <laughs> and so. Um, I became an uh, enlisted man, um, and I became a combat correspondent, which is fantastic. I mean, you would think the Marine Corps would look at a guy who's an English major and probably make him a truck driver. I mean, it actually kind of made sense to make me a, uh, a combat correspondent. And what a combat correspondent is, is the, uh, the Marine Corps version of a reporter. What that means is I couldn't write about anything bad that ever happened. Um, I will tell you a quick war story to kind of illustrate how Marine Corps journalism worked. Uh, I was on my first mission to Vietnam. We had been hit pretty hard. It was pretty scary. I, was, I can remember coming into the LZ in the helicopter, and they were yelling, hot LZ. And I looked out, and there were four guys lying on a poncho. And my first thought, not that long removed from home, was what would they be doing sleeping out here in, in this situation? 
I really, it's, that was my first thought. I hadn't seen dead people like that before. And we came in and got through the night, and this guy came over to me and he said, you've got to go over and talk to these two guys on this other hill. They took a, a prisoner without using their rifles. I said, well, that sounds pretty cool. So I went over and I found these two Marines, and sitting close to them on an ammo crate was this North Vietnamese soldier, and his wrists were bound in, in plastic. And he had this kind of strange look on his face, like, did I really do the right thing here? And they proceeded to tell me this story about how they were walking, a lot of times when Marines set in, they would pick two or three guys to take all their canteens down to a water point and fill them. And they were walking down a fairly heavy jungle trail with these 20 or 25 canteens on a wire between them without their weapons. And um, an NVA soldier came out of the brush with his AK-47 and they knew they were dead. And um, they negotiated with him. And I said, what'd you say, you don't speak? And he said, we said, somehow we said if he came with us, he would have beer. <laughs> that was part of the negotiation. And little by little, they said they saw the barrel of the gun come down. And they took him prisoner. And I said, this is great. I just got here. This will be the first thing I write for the Marine Corps. And um, I got back to Dong Ha, where our base was, and I wrote it. And at the time, everything we wrote went through a, uh, a press office in Da Nang. And so my story came back the next day or the day after. And the across the top were written the words, Marines wouldn't go for water without their weapons. So it never happened. I know it happened. I talked to the people that did it, but it didn't happen. We're not going to do that. So my sergeant said that's a good thing to happen early on in your tour here, so now you know. Certain things happen and certain things don't happen. Um, I just want to give you some idea um, about, and I'm comparing it to our wars now, but one of my responsibilities in Vietnam was to escort civilian re reporters and photographers. And they pretty much had the run of the country. They went where they wanted to go, and we were told to get them there. Um, there were reporters that were hitching rides on helicopters, on trucks. And I say it only to, there's none of this, um, what do they call this procedure they use now, embedding. Um, they went and they reported. And they reported on Vietnam in a way we're just not seeing now in these wars, for sure. And some of them were crazy. Some of them were just a little too enamored of the danger. But boy, did they do great things. They just did amazing stuff. And I don't know if you remember Dan Rather's great moment, jumping into a foxhole next to a Marine during a firefight and, and putting a microphone in his face. But um, that sort of illustrated how, how different things have gotten. Um, the, it, it's hard to describe, and Paula and my wife always says it's hard to believe. I always say if there was such a thing as a good year in Vietnam, I had it. And um, because I got to do so many different things. I got to go with infantry units. Um, I got to go with engineers building bridges in Way. I got to spend some time with a sergeant who lived in a Montagnard village, and we went to a funeral where they passed little shells of rice wine around, and I got very woozy. Um, and I, uh, I got to, uh, I just got to see a lot. I got to see doctors and dentists going into villages. And there are all kinds of images that pop up when you think about Vietnam. I mean, Tim O'Brien just, you know, the shit field. You remember the thing about the pulling Kiowa out of the shit field? I mean, and, th and, and, and there are just little reminders. And, and one just stands out in my mind. Uh, in the s December of 68, around Christmas time, we're in a really pretty little village called Cam Lo. And it was, a, it was what they called a med cap. And doctors and dentists would go in and set up an aid station, basically, and treat whatever the villagers brought them. And it was great. It was a good PR. And two hills over, there were like five tanks lined up in case anything went wrong. But it was one of those nice, you know, nice things that happened in Vietnam. And with the doctors and dentists came this huge truck full of presents from people in the United States to the children of Vietnam. And we were all watching this little girl who was gorgeous big eyes, and, uh, <clears throat> and um, she couldn't wait for her gift to come down off the truck, and she was one of the last ones, and it was a big package that came down. It was bigger than she was, and she, and she tore it open, and she held up a pair of white figure skates oh. in tropical Vietnam. <laughs> and 
this, there was an AP photographer there, he's a Japanese guy, and he followed her. She, she walked down the street dragging these things, and you could see she was kind of wondering, well, it's a nice pair of shoes, but what's this, <laughs> you know, what's the metal thing on the bottom? Um, but there were, <laughs> there were all kinds of contrasts like that. Um, times when you would wonder, because I remember when that happened, a Navy corpsman looked over from the aid station and said, don't those bozos back in the world know anything about this place? And it was just such a, it was just so symbolic in a way. I mean, in one way, I think America at that time was more connected to the Vietnam more than we certainly are to our wars now. But there were the white figure skates in Camlo. Um, it's funny, I went back in 03, and, uh, which was the best two weeks the Providence Journal has ever given me. And I went to Cam Lowe, and I had this weird thought that maybe they'd hung those skates up on a wall or something, and, and that that girl would be, I don't know how old she was, 30-something, obviously, or more, and, um, and there was no luck. You know, I mean, it was, it was an extreme long shot, and I don't know if my interpreter really knew what, what I was asking for. I was trying to figure skates. It just didn't compute. But anyway, we didn't find them. But um, why... And I, and I keep getting back to the things they carried, but wh why it's, why the things they carried is so important. Um, I think my generation, and Bill, Bill Kelly and I were talking about this, I think we're gonna process Vietnam forever because it got to all of us. Somehow it got to all of us. It, it, we either fought or we dealt with not fighting or going to Canada or going to prison or just, you know, doing the crapshoot and hoping our number didn't come up in the lottery, or whatever it is. We process it, I think, in all kinds of ways. Um, and I'm not really sure what, what it did to me or what it didn't do to me. Um, I'm still working on it. Um, but the literature of Vietnam, I think, is so important. Um, I think it's so vital. I think it spawned... I think Vietnam spawned a literary tradition that I don't think you're going to see from the wars now. Um, I don't have anything good to say about the wars now, including the fact that it doesn't have a great literary tradition. But um, there's, there's this, which when it came out, word got around. You know, I don't know if those of you who read it when it first came out 30-some years ago remember, but this is the one you got to read. And it was because it made you work. But you realize what a brave book it is. Because he went where others really hadn't gone. He wasn't just giving a combat memoir. He was pushing it. And as he said, you know, to tell the truth, to tell the story. And he told the story. And so I think books become part of the processing. And before I forget to do this, I want to mention, um, if you really want to get into it, um, and I know this is required reading here, but um, I want to mention a, a book called Matterhorn because it came out last year um, by a guy named Carl Marlantes. And it's a wonderful Vietnam novel. And the one thing it deals with that Tim O'Brien didn't, um, for reasons unknown, is the racial tension that was a huge part of the Vietnam War. Um, Marlantes really kind of takes it head on in, in Matterhorn. And it was a sad byproduct, but you got to remember, Vietnam was the first time a lot of people had mixed the way they mixed over there. You know, I mean, I came from an all-white suburb of Detroit. I didn't know squat. I went to a men's college in upstate New York that probably had three black guys in it. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm with these guys from, you know, the tough side of town. A lot of them were draftees. A lot of them were inner-city kids. A lot of them were real pieces of work. And... And I think there was that realization that, okay, you know, we're taking this shit in Vietnam. We're not going to put up with the crap we put up with up till now, you know. And there was an edginess in Vietnam at that point. You didn't see it in, in combat. You didn't see it in the combat units. But in the rear, it was a very sad, you know, kind of, there was almost like a gang presence in the rear. And people were, you know, getting together certain numbers before they'd go anywhere. And when we got to Okinawa on the way home, they told us, don't go out on the base without at least six people. And that was such a sad comment. But it was a, it was a time of such turmoil, and we were all coming to terms with you know, what was going on, and that was a part of it. And that was a huge part of, of the Vietnam experience. Um, 
I'm incredibly grateful because I met, you know, as I said, I met people that I just wasn't going to meet anywhere else. And um, I'm the better for it, I think. I think I'm a better newspaper man for it, especially. Uh, the Vietnam Connection and the Veteran Connection has been incredible value to me in my work at the Journal. Um, I did want to say a little bit about this trip um, back in 03. I had always wanted to go back, and um, I was never quite sure how I would do it. And I went into my editor one day, who was a Vietnam veteran, and I said, if I can get to Vietnam on my own, can I do it on company time? And he said, no, we'll pay you. We'll pay for it. We'll pay. That would not happen today at the Journal, believe me. But, <laughs> but um, he, uh, he said, we'll send you. And so in February of 03, with lots of snow on the ground, Paula dropped me off at Green Airport. And I don't know how many hours later, I was in Hanoi. And it was so strange uh, to think I was in the capital of North Vietnam, where we had bombed and bombed and bombed. And I'm sitting on the porch of this very nice hotel at night, looking out at the two lakes that are in the center of the city. And it just an incredible feeling came over me of some kind of resolution. I mean, I, I, it didn't, wasn't coming full circle or anything. But I said, I really should be here. You know, I really should see this place unarmed. And the next morning, I went to meet May Van On, who's a bit of a celebrity. Um, he is the guy who pulled John McCain out of the lake. And um, you go into his little house in the middle of Hanoi, and there's a huge poster of him hugging John McCain um, when John McCain came to see him. And we, we sat there as his wife was fixing rice for the noonday meal. And we're in this peaceful little house, and I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, this is just too good. This is like I'm doing this on the job. I am sitting with this man. And he was about early 80s at the time, little classic, the white mustache and maybe 95 pounds soaking wet. And he explained to me how he came home that day and the air raid sirens were going off. He came home from his factory job and ran to the shelter as he always did. And they all, they all looked up. They heard the explosion and they saw this parachute coming down. And they saw it coming down into the lake. And the feeling on the shore was, let him drown. He's an American, let him drown. And, May Van On explained to me that Ho Chi Minh taught us to treat our enemies as well as our friends. So he, he, he swam out with a piece of bamboo for flotation. And he pulled this guy who had to weigh, you're talking about a flight suit, a parachute, and his body. And he had to weigh a ton. And he pulled him in. And people on the shore then tried to beat McCain to death, according to him. And police showed up and took him to the Hanoi Hilton. Um, but that was the beginning of this amazing two weeks from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City, um, where I at one point went over the old territory uh, where I had served. Uh, some things looked familiar, most things didn't. Um, and one amazing moment when um, we went to Khe San. I don't know, does that register with anybody? Khe San was a, this bloody siege during the Tet Offensive, where Marines were just basically trapped in this valley and hit with guns from the Laotian side of a nearby mountain day after day after day. And the planes would develop an ability to come in and drop their loads and pick up what they needed to pick up and take off without ever fully stopping. And what's there now are these two sections of metal runway. That's all there is. They left two sections of the metal runway. And you can stand on those two sections and you look up through what are now coffee trees and you imagine what it was like to come down that in a, maybe a C-130. Yes, and imagine what that must have been like and the uncertainty of it. And um, I'm, I'm standing there and I'm looking, I'm look, and I look over to my left, and here are these two guys holding these trays, like kind of like cigarette girls used to carry in nightclubs. I think I don't, I don't go quite that far back, but uh, and they come and they and they have these trays full of um, of charred dog tags and um, and decorations you know, ribbons, American, and they're, and they're selling, they're selling them. So I looked at my interpreter and he said, you tell them what you want to tell them. And I said, okay. And I told them how they were disgracing the dead, basically. And I, I screamed a little bit. Uh, and they just kept smiling. And I said, there's no point to this. I mean, they're trying to make the best of a ridiculous situation. 
Um, so um, I left. I left. And I got so mad that a young German girl, I think she was German, bought, a, bought one of the ribbons and pinned it on her boyfriend, and they all kind of giggled about it. I later learned that there was a real cottage industry in um, dog tags and ribbons. They weren't originals. They just made them look as if they were charred or beat up a little bit to make them more original. But they were, they were an ingenious little piece of work. Um, but I, I, try, I try to think, I keep trying to think, and rereading the things they carried certainly made me get to it again, um, where it all fits in. And, and one, one thing that the Vietnam experience has done for me is it's connected me to some absolutely amazing people. And last Saturday, I was talking to my friend. Oh, boy, I'm really going to lose it on this one. Um, uh, my friend Joe Labriola, um, who, had just, who had just reread this too. Joe was a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he was a Marine back in kind of the Wild West days, 65, 66. He was twice shot out of country, um, had a lot of medals, um, incredibly proud of his Marine Corps service, incredibly proud. Um, but in 1973, uh, Joe was accused of, um, of killing a drug dealer in Dedham. And he admits he was, living, he was living crazy after Vietnam, but he said he didn't do it. I read his trial transcripts. I don't know how they convicted him, but um, he remembers during his trial the prosecutor coming up to him very closely and saying, you were in Vietnam, weren't you? And you were in the Marines, and you killed people, so killing is no big deal for you. And of course, the judge had to stricken it from the record. Um, but Joe said the damage was done. You know, the skunk had already been thrown in the jury box. And Joe's in 38 years into his life sentence. And he is one of the most amazing, resilient people I know. He's got an incredible spirit. He has read everything I think ever written. Um, we have these wonderful visits. He was at, when I first saw him, he was in maximum security. He has since moved down to medium security in Shirley. And we had these great two, two and a half hour conversations um, that are just, that go all over the place. And he said how, how lucky he thought you people were that you were discovering this book, if you hadn't already. And then he said, well, tell him what it's like to do this, and tell him what it's, no. and then he said, no, don't tell him any war stories. And it's funny because um, when, at the end of our visits, um, Joe and I always salute. And uh, sorry about that. Um, and we salute and hug and, um, and it's just, it's, I guess it's a Marine thing, or it's a Vietnam thing, but it's a very good thing. And with that, I think this is a very good place for me to stop for now. Um, are there any questions you have? I've got a few other things I want to deal with, but uh, come on. <laughs> yes. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. I can't, I'm not sure. <laughs> Could you tell me that again? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, question about the book or any comments you want to make about the book especially. Um, yes. What did you mean when you said the coverage is entirely different? You're saying that the government is just permanently controlling? Oh, I think, I think there's no question. I think there's no question. I think embedding was a brilliant piece of work uh, because it restricted where people went. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and that was, I mean, there are people that blame the defeat in Vietnam on the press. I mean, there had, for years that's, that's been kind of accepted among, I think, military professionals and so forth that, that the press undermined the war effort and uh, they weren't going to make that mistake again and let people roam around freely because they really did. I mean, they went, they went wherever they wanted to go. 
Yeah. Yeah. Short yeah. But I mean, it's incredible when you think about it, and you don't, uh, I'm sure you don't remember, a lot of you don't remember, but some of you do. Uh, the six o'clock news every night was Vietnam. Um, all the time. And Life Magazine would come out with these incredible full issues of combat pictures. And now it's like, go to the mall, you know? Just don't think about it. It's, um, it's pretty discouraging. And I don't think, uh, I don't know if you're gonna get the things they carried out this war. I don't know if you're gonna get one of those. Um, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just discouraging. We have a series starting in the journal this Sunday and we're committed to selling newspapers any way we can at this point. <laughs> and it's about returning veterans and what they're going through. And you know, the, the word after Vietnam was never again. Never again are we gonna send people off on a war when we don't know the real reason for sending them. I'm sort of paraphrasing there. Well, we did it again, didn't we? And um, it's a really good series. I've read part of it. Because uh, these guys are, you know, the incredible irony is these guys are crossing paths at PTSD clinics with Vietnam veterans. Um, so it's, it's a pretty sad comment that uh, uh, we're back in the same place in an awful lot of ways. We really are. Come on, you got to have more questions than that after. Yes. <laughs> this is a plant, this question, actually. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was amazing. It was, um, yeah, it was on Lavender Stationery, as I recall. Um, uh, and she not only was ending things, she was telling me she was married. This was like six, six months after I left. It was, it was a crusher. Um, I didn't go crazy. A guy offered me a bottle of scotch that he'd been saving for his wedding anniversary. So, uh, but it's it's funny, but it's it's incredibly weird because there were suicides because of Dear John letters. Um, there were guys who were allowed to go home and try to patch things up through the Red Cross because of Dear John letters. There were Dear John letters where the women sent pictures of their of them with their new boyfriends <laughs> to guys in Vietnam. So um, I did get one, but it was not one of the real, uh, you know, I got over it. I got married to Paula, which was <laughs> much better. Bob, I have a question. Good. The, uh, as I was growing up, there was much discussion about the impact of um, news coverage and, and what the soldiers were, um, how potentially And I didn't know if, if um, soldiers there were aware of the controversy that it created back here in the U.S. or whether you guys had that information. It's a, it's a good question. I think, I don't know. I, I, again, I'll go back to my friend Joe Labriola, Joe Lab. And there's a freejolab.org website if you want to check it out. They're friends of his maintain it. Um, um, but Joe was convicted in 1973. And I don't know if you remember, but the image of the Vietnam veteran in 1973 was pretty much of a psychopath with long scraggly hair and an old field jacket and a rifle. I mean, it was, it had gotten to that point, in, in, in popular culture at least. And Joe has always thought that that was part of the reason uh, that he got convicted, uh, that the popular perception was of these crazy people coming back. I talked to one of his jurors, the only one who would talk to me, and he said, we couldn't wait to get in that jury room to convict him. Uh, and I said, why? You had no physical evidence. You had no eyewitness. He said, but yeah, but that was a life none of us knew anything about. And um, he just, I thought he sort of betrayed a, a prejudice going in. But anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, there, I don't know if people who were there felt the impact of that, you know, on them initially. Um, I don't really know. Uh, it was weird, it, it's, and it was so different. You got to remember, there was no, there was no Skype. You know, there were no cell phones. There were no instant communications with home. There were letters, and um, there were things called Mars calls, which were very weird. They were done through ham radio operators. 
and you would be talking to your mother and you'd have to say over. <laughs> and, then it, and then if she forgot to say over, she couldn't, it was, I, it was ridiculous. But um, uh, this is, this has got to be more, this should be just, yes. I think that's why, you know, when I, when Sally told me they were, you know, this was a book this year, that's why, one reason I was so glad to see it, because you can make, you can just let it fade so easily and not learn the lessons. And uh, there are plenty of lessons, believe me. Um, let me do a quick poll in here. Uh, how many think we should bring back the draft? That's a problem. Was it three? Four? I think we should. I think it should be even legit. I don't Absolutely, I think it should be maybe maybe require national service, you know, or some form. But we're we're way too way too detached now from our wars. We really are. If you, I don't know any, how many of you have talked to guys coming home from Iraq or Afghanistan, but it's it's they're they're walking into a vacuum. I mean, it's like they, you know, nobody knows what they've been, where they've been. It's horrible, and uh, it's got to be shared. It's got to be shared, but. Anyway, come on. Jeez, I wasn't that fascinating. Uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I'm not getting a lot of response here. Um, oh. Yes. I had, two, I, when, I had a weird thing. When I washed out of OCS, I was on two years active duty as a reserve. Four years was the standard. You know, um, and if I'd been an officer, it would have been four years. But uh, that was enough. I was, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I saw that. I am. Um, I mean, you, there are a lot of stories, and I think a lot of them apocryphal, about Viet Vietnam veterans getting spit on in the airports and stuff because they were so despised for messing up. I don't know. God knows what reason. Um, but I'm not. I'm not sure they were. I think it was more of a media. Thing. Well, I think I think it was more of a media thing, but I don't know if. I mean, I came home and got normal real fast. I mean, I got a job and I didn't. I didn't get messed up, and I didn't need to go to a clinic or anything. Um, but I didn't see the protest movement so much seeing veterans as, I thought the protest movement was actually pretty sympathetic to veterans. I don't know. Well, I think there was part of it. Yeah. Part of it that started to, and not the part that I was yeah. part of, but, but the more extreme elements who started to say, well, you know, how it should go to and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't, I think, um, 
And I don't know how, I was asked that in a, in a forum shortly after I got back, how did protest affect the morale or whatever in, in Vietnam? And uh, I don't, I don't, I, can't, I don't know. I can't remember it having a lot of impact. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was also very active in um, anti-war movement in the late 60s, early 70s. And one of the things I remember is that the effectiveness from our perspective of the anti-war movement really picked up when Vietnam vets against the war became active. And some of you may have seen Born in the USA. And um, at that point, it was their stories, it was their sense yeah. that what they had volunteered for or had been drafted for was not what they were experiencing. Right. And from my perspective, they were the most powerful. That person. really turned a lot of people, I think. Absolutely. Made John Kerry a big deal. If I could too, Bob, just so you know, uh, the BBAW was still in place. Yeah, I know, I know. It, it was. It really was. It was. I mean, who better to tell the story of? Oh yeah. Of a, a failed policy. Is John Kerry still a dirty word? Uh, you know what? No. <laughs> okay. No. no. Yeah, I want to ask you one question as a follow-up to that, and, and and that is really getting back to the book as well. And that has to do with that strange mixed experience of war, which is the mm -hmm. horror of it. And yet, and I think the things that carried really demonstrates it does. the humanity of it. The, the, the linkage between those guys, and I've noticed this with my brother who was in the Navy for <coughs> seven years. His friendships are something that are the most solid that I know of. But you know what's weird? There's, a, th seen that with that There's almost a, a weird tradition that you always vow because you've been through this with these people. You're going to get together when you get back. And we're going to, the guys I was with, we were in a small unit, we we're going to get together every year. We never did. And uh, some say that's a subconscious thing to, that you don't want to talk about it anymore. But, um, you know, I saw one guy that I, I stay occasionally friendly with, but um, we didn't, and you would think after that, you know, after a year of that, you would want to and tell some war stories and get drunk and, and but uh, we didn't, we didn't. It's a very strange thing, but if you all read this book, you have, right? Yes. I think it does. I think you get a sense of priorities that you don't get anywhere else, and what matters and what doesn't. And I think, I really think you have less tolerance for bullshit when you've been there. <laughs> and you, you know, you tend to have a natural filter in place in a way. And I'm not surprised to hear you say that, because I think, you know. But feeds into, too, I just spent five years working at the Providence VA, so I've been, you know, kind of submerged in that environment. I have a good friend, she's in her early 20s, and she's, uh, she's a vet, her husband's a vet, they're a military family, and she says if she could, she would go back in a second, she would, she would raise and listen. Thank you, And she says, she says that you find in the military this camaraderie and this, this focus that you don't find anywhere else. I'm just kind of wondering, tying into what you said, we're not very related to our wars today. What's, what do you think would be one strategy that we could sort of bring the general public back into understanding at least why it's not just a sort of a military impulse. Like I think coverage is used, and the media have kind of opted out. Um, and uh, part of it is, I think, the control of embedding, but part of it is numbers. I think, I, you know, I talked to one TV guy, and he said it's a very cold calculation that people don't want to watch the war or read about it. And I think until that changes, I don't think we're going to reconnect with a lot of people. Um, because you're not going to get a lot of people, you know, to go, you know, to a forum on, on Iraq or, or Afghan veterans, you know. And, um, and because it's an all-volunteer army, um, people don't feel threatened. They don't feel any threat until 
their family's going to get dragged in. So, um, I think that I think it's a huge failure. I think there'll be studies uh, about the coverage of these wars in years to come. About. I think we're disconnected even now too. I remember during Desert Storm being in school myself and soldiers coming in and us writing letters to the soldiers that were in our neighborhoods and sending packages. I don't know if they do that so much anymore. The start. I never get to it. The guy at Warwick Pilgrim High School and they asked me to come down. He was he was just back from Iraq. And he had a whole, he, he was great. He had a PowerPoint presentation. He had, you know, he had great pictures and tell these kids about what it's like. And three were on the cell phone. Back to the mic, please. We're having trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, I got a problem with that. I was just saying I was at Warwick Vets High School one day because an Iraq vet, who a former student, had come back to talk to the students. And he had a great presentation. And three, at least three of the students had cell phones, you know. Uh, and that's what I ended up writing about, the kids on the cell phones, which kind of upset the school a little bit. But, um, <laughs> but it's like a distraction. Yeah, yeah, the war. You know, I mean, there's almost that it look, like, yeah, 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 okay, the war, the war. Um, and it's, it's too much of that, you know? And I don't know. In answer to your question, I don't know. I don't know how we make people more engaged. Yes? I think part of it is being a person who lived during Vietnam, my husband was drafted, did not go to Vietnam, he served in Germany. Um, and then this is like a repeat. Oh my God, all these young people are over there. It's a war that we have no control. We feel like, I don't want to read about it every day. Yeah. I lived through part of it already. Now I'm seeing the same thing. It's sad. It's depressing. I feel helpless. I don't, I'll, read, I'll start to read. I'm reading the book. I haven't read the other. I haven't watched the old war movies. I, I get too upset. <coughs> feel helpless. And I think that's what a lot of people feel. It's not disinterest. It's almost you don't you it's don't interesting. Want to deal with it because it's too difficult. Yeah. It's very, very difficult. Now if it led the news every night at six, would you look somewhere else? I mean I watch the news every night. Yeah. Every well, but I'm home in time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let me give you a couple of generations back. There have been five major wars in my life. I was born just before World War II, and both my brothers who were older served in it. I did not participate in the Vietnam War um, knowledge as well as I should because I had three small sons. I'll do it. We couldn't turn the six o'clock news on. But my son has been on golf. My grandson has been in Iraq. We are a military family. And um, this whole history of wars leads us in and out. At least it's led me in and out of the experience. But I've always tried to stay connected. And what I missed in Vietnam, I picked up in Tim O'Brien's book. Yes, yeah. Very true. Apropos of nothing, I just want to share one quick image with you. But um, <clears throat> I was in Camp Pendleton for two weeks before Vietnam. And there's a little town of Oceanside outside of Camp Pendleton, um, which is a really depressing service town. That may be redundant, depressing service town. But, um, and one night we were, there were a bunch of people, there was a TV, appliance stores used to turn their TVs to the sidewalk. And there were a bunch of us watching the Chicago Convention. And it was when the police ran riot. And there were these cheers for the cops. It was the weirdest thing on the sidewalk. I mean, maybe not surprising, considering the situation we were in. But it was a very, I just kind of slinked away. I just, uh, I don't know. I share that for no other reason than it was an interesting moment. Yes? We have indeed. Decades, uh, and I'd like to just offer a, a, a bit of an interesting, I think, different perspective. Uh, I too was part of the Vietnam War experience, uh, and when you pointed out uh, the option of uh, being drafted or going to Canada, there was a third option, which was uh, where you went. That I chose, uh, which was to confront the illegality and the immorality of that war by saying to the United States government that you're wrong and I was willing to then take, not take the step forward right. 
and instead to go to prison as part of a war resistance movement and a draft resistance movement. Uh, but I still feel very proud of being part of today because I think we have a responsibility as citizens of the planet to be anti-war if we think that war is destructive to our future. And I hold that belief. Um, I also think that for those uh, with whom I share the experience of being part of that anti-war movement, that there was a misconception that it was an anti-veteran yeah. effort. Uh, the perception of anti-war activists spitting on veterans when they returned to the United States was a small minority of that anti-war movement. Very small, I think. Most were motivated, as I was motivated, to uh, grapple with how do we get our classmates, our friends, our generation away from harm's way, out of that war experience, back home, nurturing their families and nurturing their local communities. So I was always and felt, and I was in Chicago in 1968 uh, with Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin and the likes uh, to say no to the then Johnson administration and then Humphrey administration, or attempted administration, we had Nixon instead, so that shows you how that failure occurred. But nonetheless, uh, you know, I think it's important to get to the point of where are we now? And I agree with those who say that we're, at least my generation, and I'm an activist extreme in terms of even help holding elected office for 20 years of my life in this community, feeling now at this point that I'm not sure that democracy, American style, is going to survive. I think that the failure is everything from 20% turnout the most recent preliminary election. I think 11% turnout in Taunton in their preliminary <coughs> election last night. And I, I guess maybe I pose this question particularly to the young people who are here today. Uh, do you hold a sense of optimism for the democracy? And do you hold uh, an understanding of the reality of those who are anti-establishment and even anti-government are not necessarily and assuredly most often aren't anti-American or anti-hope. You know, we just are frustrated, I'm frustrated, by what seems to be a lack of interest in making this democracy work. So I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a real easy point to make, but if there was a draft now, you would have a much greater awareness and a much greater active protest movement. But, but because a big part of the protest movement in the 60s was based on a desire not to get shot. And just to that, I, I have mixed feelings. I've heard you speak that position, and from this, from the perspective that I think we have our troops home from Afghanistan, assuredly, and 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 probably from other places, Iraq as well. Uh, if there were a draft, uh, on the other hand, I'm also opposed to the infringement upon our rights, and I and I I oppose the draft at least partially because of my opposition to involuntary yeah. servitude. I think that. A draft infringes upon people's freedom of choice. It certainly so does. I, I, I certainly conflict with, in a sense, I'd like the draft to be there to stop the war, but I don't want to infringe upon everyone's right to choose what they wish to choose. Yeah. How long did you go to prison for if you did go into the draft? How much? Were you? How long were you in prison for if you did the draft? If you resisted the draft, like how long were how long did you do? I had a year sentence in which I served two, 10 months, and that was considered a very short sentence at the time. Most sentences being uh, handed out at that time with three to five years. Yeah, we're in a set, yeah, we're, we're in a set you know, like the time. Of. Yes? I, I, I'm concerned by the term that we say that democracy isn't working. The problem is the president doesn't declare war. In other words, if we really said we cannot send the armies on the move without using the correct form of democracy that we have, it is the Congress that declares war. Yeah, to be. Who would make those 50 senators sign their name and those 300 some House of Representatives, they have to sign their name on a delegate? Do you actually think they would? Yeah. In other words, the democracy works. It's just that we're, we're the president now is sending people. We're not. These, what are the 
these operations that they call them. They're wars, but they're not declared for us. Therefore, there is no draft. The peace is right. That the people, my representative, I would call my representative so fast as I don't want to go to war. Don't you do this line? Yes. Um, I think we can we have a voice about this. It's well, we should. going through the president over, not the president, but actually but the, the military every time moving this war machine ahead. We have a way to stop this. We just don't use the right way. I like to think we do. You cannot match armies without a declaration of war. <laughs> and we do anyway. But we do. But that's because we don't know that we can't. We don't just protest that movement every single time. Mm. They say Operation Desert Storm, Operation something. What, the, what is that term? With a war, you have yeah. to say, what? who is the enemy? Yeah. How am I going to win it? That would be discussion between the Senate and the well, you House. Have, you, have to, I mean, you have the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which was used to justify Vietnam. And you have weapons of mass destruction, which was used to justify Iraq, both of which turned out to be, you know, the total frauds. But, yeah. The yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. Where's the, where are the, is problem, anyway. I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think our, our culture is... And it's the same thing with media. I feel like what you were saying earlier. Mm. It's more about numbers than it is about anything else. Yep. CNN's disappointed that they can't jump on the bias wagon because Fox has one side and MSNBC has yeah. the other. You know, and that's, that's so sad as a comment on the American Very sad. Yes. Steve is pointing out, if you think it's wrong, and you, you know, and your belief is that it is wrong, it's wow, to be changed. Like, uh, yeah, if you, uh, <laughs> you know, like, like Steve Kamara said, if you believe it's wrong, and you fervently believe it's wrong, and you feel you have a to try to change it, I, would, I think it's, it would be, not, it wouldn't be, it would be unpatriotic not to, in a way, I think. I mean, I mean it really would. Patriotism is all about participation. And, um, Then you've got a, you've got one of those ribbon bumper stickers on your car, that say "Support the troops," and you don't go too much farther. You know, that's. I mean, there's all people use the term bumper sticker patriotism, and there is a bumper sticker patriotism that's, that doesn't go a whole lot deeper than the bumper. But, um, you know, thanks for putting up with my rambling. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have one more. As, as you as you have the uh, idea like me, uh, I have the way uh, United to fight in Vietnam because that's my opinion. I haven't learned anything. We don't want to spread the comedy all over, all the world, you know. And then when we fight, we not win because they do a cruel trick, uh, trick you know. They put the people, they wearing the same, the people, they live in the hometown, and uh, you so why I'm afraid because you're too dangerous on that time. You walk in, you don't know where you as an enemy, right? So uh, sometimes they talk to it, the people, and then they shut up, you know, they put the forehead there. They, they didn't put that mic, they put like four or five, right? And then they just aim in there, and when you walk in, they shoot you, and then they run. And they hire the people. How are you gonna fight a war like that? Is, that, that is, I wanna ask you. I said my comment is that uh, the way you see, it or, or not that all my No, I think if I understand you correctly. Yeah. One of the great things we failed in Vietnam to do yeah. was to understand the connection 
of the people of their land. Right. And that was their greatest ally was, and you couldn't fight. There's a very famous quote from a general who was fighting around Saigon who said, I know they're here, I just can't find them. And they're all down in the Coochie Tunnels, which were a masterpiece of engineering below the ground. But you're, you're absolutely right. Oh. <laughs> you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, you go, I mean, part of, the, part of my visit in 03 was to tunnel complexes. And there was one up by this, in this beautiful little village on the South China Sea, just over the DMZ into North Vietnam. It wasn't North Vietnam at the time. But they were so proud. They had a three-level tunnel system. They had a hospital in there. They had dining rooms. Seven children had been born in there. And they said, the B-52s never penetrated. And there was, you could see the B-52 craters were still there. And they were so proud of the fact that they had withstood the B-52s. And it's that kind of connection that you can't defeat that. I mean, you can't. They're going to do whatever they have to do. They're going to dig with hand shovels and picks and you know, create a society underground until it's time to come out and fight. And how, you, you know, doesn't matter how many B-52s you have in that situation. So, anyway. Never again, right? Never again. Yes. Yes. Um, I teach writing, and um, I've had a number of veterans in my classes, and some of them have written about their experiences. Um, some not. Maybe some might want to in the future, though. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for them. So you're, you're talking about the, the sort of quality of literature that we're currently yeah. getting um, out of, uh, you know, more current conflicts. And I'm wondering if there's something that, um, some wisdom you can impart from your experience of also writing about Vietnam, not just... I would, I would, for one thing, I'd steal straight from him. I would steal the idea of you don't have to tell the truth to tell the story. And let your, let your feelings go beyond the memory of what happened. And because he does that to enhance and make the story more powerful. And I think that's huge. I mean, you can, you can really get hung up trying to just, you know, recall. Um, I have my friend Joe Labrio, I don't know if I mentioned it, but I have his nine diaries on my desk at home. And uh, it's some of the best. You know, I just pick it. I had him on my desk at work for a while, and I just brought him home. Um, but he has, a, he has an ability. He has an amazing writing ability um, because he lets his feelings and his memories mix, you know. And um, it's, 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 I think it's really powerful. I don't, they shouldn't feel constrained, you know, by what happened, you know. Uh, I don't think. Bob? Yep. Um, That's it. On uh, behalf of the committee, They'd like you to have this, and, and uh, I'd like to say my colleague uh, Denise Damasio had said that one of the things of, of one book is to try to 3D up the book uh, for everyone, and boy, you really 3D'd up this experience. Um, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.